In this new uh, pandemic world, uh, physical and social boundaries have become more important, either implemented by authorities or by people uh, themselves. Countries have closed their borders and started choosing who is allowed to pass through. Regions, cities, companies, communities, family, uh, families are building up boundaries uh, to protect themselves and their loved ones from the risks of a barely visible uh, danger. But also, uh, the world has witnessed that this difficult time uh, can be handled as an opportunity to restructure the lines of demarcation between different parts of the world because of the uh, digital technologies. In the next few days uh, during the Design Fest, we will have an opportunity to listen to distinguished scholars and professionals um, on these issues in many different ways. Uh, through their valuable contributions, we will explore the ways of breaking boundaries between individuals, between individuals and nature, between real and virtual, to design new solutions for our uh, daily problems. Before we start, uh, I extend my sincere appreciation to our organizing team, uh, led by our vice dean, Ferai Maden. I would also like to thank to all of our contributors and participants for sharing uh, this special event with us. That said, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Robert Mull, a very valuable and immensely inspiring colleague architect, scholar, and a friend. So, yeah. Robert Mull is a professor of architecture and design at the University of Brighton, visiting professor at Umeå University of Sweden, and managing director at Publica, an urban design practice based in London. Robert was previously Director of Architecture and Dean of the CAS Faculty of Art, Architecture and Design, affectionately known as the Altgate Bauhaus. Robert uh, co-founded the Moscow School of Architecture and now leads the Global Free Unit, a new educational structure with educational, NGO, and institutional uh, partners focusing on live projects within the European refugee crisis and institutions, including prisons, schools, and communities. I have had the uh, privilege of working with uh, Robert on, ongoing, uh, uh, on an ongoing project funded by the British Academy and the live classroom on the refugee crisis and their spatial needs. I'm very excited to have him here with us uh, for his presentation today. Uh, thank you, Robert, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Melton. I'm, I'm extremely honoured to be talking to you and um, I suppose even more honoured to be working with some of your students uh, and colleagues at the university on the work that we're doing around the refugee crisis and settlement in, in Basmani and Torbali. So I will come and say more about that. I'm quite nervous speaking to you because I'm sure many of you know much more about the context than, than I do, but um, I will anyway. So I'm going to say just a couple of words first about, I suppose, how one got to this conversation um, about areas of deprivation, areas of political change, um, and the potential of those areas in relation to education, but also in relation to just being useful and making a difference. So I suppose for a long time in my various activities as a sort of activist, um, as an educationalist, founding institutions and running them and working on projects. I've been very, very interested in those parts of the world where I suppose conventional systems, forms of organizations, rule structures are under stress and what one can find out by working in those areas when one returns to a context which is less stressed, more familiar. So I've worked in all sorts of contexts. Um, these are probably some of the most extreme working in um, Beijing um, a few months after the Tiananmen massacre, working in West Belfast in Northern Ireland 
where the Protestant and Catholic um, communities have been um, at war effectively um, since the, the 60s. And many projects, I suppose, that I've overseen or have happened in the institutions I've been involved in, where areas are suffering real deprivation, real political change, scarce resources. And it's always been part of the philosophy of teaching that we actually build, we make things, we go into these places and we do stuff that is useful. Part of that commitment has been this very, very simple statement um, around this thing called duty of care. And I really want to focus on it for a moment. Um, duty of care is built into law. I'm sure exactly the same thing happens in Turkey. And I just want to read it to you. It is a fundamental concept of the law that you owe a duty to all persons you can reasonably foresee would be directly or closely affected by your actions. For it is assumed that you ought reasonably to have them in mind when you commit your acts. This is absolutely part of the moral code that architects and designers, interior architects have to adhere to. And I suppose I would argue in many of the contexts that I've been working in, it doesn't really happen. But the people involved in working in those situations and architecture more generally don't always have everybody who is affected by their actions in mind when they do what they do. And that's worried me for quite a long time. I think we live in quite sort of uniquely careless times. So there is a duty of care, but there is a general carelessness. And there's a huge carelessness, particularly in dealing with issues of displacement by governments, by um, authorities, by designers, if, if one's honest. I also feel that in a sense, probably not in the Turkish context, but certainly within the more marketized UK context, there's also a carelessness in education. It's very expensive, it's very stressful, a lot of people drop out of it, it's not very diverse, and there's huge layers and levels of stress and, and mental problems in, in architectural education. So hold these two ideas, the idea of duty of care and the idea of the stress of the system what I want to focus on now is really a very precise case study, if you like. Yes, one's worked in, in, in India, one's worked in a whole series of places, but since 2015, and you all know this very, very well, I've been involved in work that touches upon the European refugee crisis, particularly around the holes of European refugee crisis working from here, which you're familiar, this is Lesbos in 2015, looking across to Turkey, looking across to Izmir at the height of the refugee crisis, this particular bit of water um, that is still the boundary um, line in relation to the EU-Turkey um, deal. And also a lot of work on this map here. So we've done work from the Eastern Mediterranean um, from Turkey through to Greece, but also followed the refugee route right up to where currently working at the moment as a visiting professor in Sweden, but also through the whole of Europe to the Calais refugee camp on the um, northern coast of France, and now to the south coast of the UK, where many, many refugees are arriving by boat in exactly the same way that they were arriving in Lesbos in 2015 and 16. If we go back for a second to this statement, utility, identity and education within the refugee crisis, I'm really interested in this conversation between utility, function and identity. And I'm wanting to trace that through a series of projects. I suppose one of the issues around utility is the fact that the refugee situation is often characterised as numbers, as statistics, not as individuals. It's a very, very well understood sort of change 
And this concept of othering refugees or othering displaced people is a really, really important one. And I suppose in the work that we've done, we've tried not to other refugees, not to other the things that they do, but to recognize them and celebrate them. And you'll see that through the talk as we return closer to, to, to Basmani and Torbali. But that having been said, the, the numbers are really, really important and very, very worrying. And here are just a few of them. 79.5 million is the current number of people worldwide who are displaced, displaced for a long period of time. 200 million, and some people talk about a billion people by 2040, 2050, additional people will be displaced as a result of climate change. And ultimately that results in one in 45 of the global population. The other figure, 17, is the much contested but fairly accurate figure, which represents how long, on average, people remain displaced. How long are they in transit? How long are they displaced before they feel that they've arrived somewhere? It's distorted to some extent by the Palestinian diaspora, but only in a minor way. So this is a big issue. It's growing. It's about long-term displacement and settlement, not just disaster relief. These are two images from the Calais migrant camp, which I think sort of sum up some of the issues I'd like to talk about. On the left, and I'll tell you more about this a little bit later, on the left is the official camp built by the French authorities. And on the right is a wonderful house from um, the informal camp that was next to the formal camp on the left. On the left is the camp that displaced people, when they entered it, had to register as a formal refugee in France and they could no longer travel. On the right is where people um, formed their own informal settlement on the basis that they were unregistered and they wanted to travel on typically to the UK. So let's just play with these two images. On the left is something which I think talks about the utilitarian response to the refugee crisis. And on the right is something that really does remind us of the degree to which people wish to carry with them and celebrate identity. This is built, I think, by uh, a um, Sudanese refugee. It's a wonderful piece of architecture. I'm gonna say that, I think it's architecture. So on the left, we have codified values. On the right, we have unregulated. On the left, we have the formal. On the right, we have the informal. On the left, we have registered. On the right, we have unregistered. On the left, we have safe in inverted commas. On the right, we have unsafe in inverted commas. On the left, we have utilitarian. On the right, we have expressive. On the left, we have utility. And on the right, we have something that celebrates identity. And a lot of the work that we're doing and the research that we're doing is trying to understand what one can learn from the right-hand side, from the house. How can we capture the identity of displaced people and use that to begin to design with rather than ignore it? So just to introduce you in detail to this thesis that there's a lot to be learned from the informal camp and that there's architectural moves, language, urbanism that one can learn from that. I'm going to ask you to come on a journey with me to that same place, that Calais jungle um, in 2016, early 2016, the height of its um, size and sort of um, um, strength and I want you to look at it in the same way that you would look at any other city. So don't think of it as something different, just imagine you've arrived here in the same way that if you were on holiday you might arrive in an unfamiliar city in a different country. So let's just play that game, sort of uh, indulge me, let me just go through that. 
This is a plan of the Calais jungle made by its inhabitants. It's a map of the city, which is the Calais jungle. It's familiar, it has a high street, it has public buildings, it has areas. So it has the Pakistani area, the Afghan area, the Eritrean area, the Sudanese area, etc. None of this involves any architects, none of this involves any planners. This is entirely made by its inhabitants. So let's enter that city, that informal city, the Calais jungle. It has public buildings. This is the church built by Eritrean refugees by themselves. This is the side of it, which I think is quite extraordinary. This is the entrance to that church. And this is the interior. I think this is architecture. It's using light, it's using proportion. It has immense amount of cultural and emotional significance. It's rather wonderful. This is the interior and it has de details, details that have been carefully manufactured and carefully linked into ceremony and into the life of the church. It has a high street with shops on it, many shops. It has a library, it has schools. This is a school built by this man. There were several schools within the Calais jungle. Those schools have timetables like any other school. It has bathhouses and hammams. It has laundries with timetable and with the amounts of costs. It has a theater the amazing Good Chance Theatre that was the centre of everything to do with um, art practice and, and, and celebration. All the time really sort of, I suppose, remembering what it is that's really going on here. Of course, the Cali jungle was a terrible place. One's not saying it wasn't, one is simply saying that there's something to be learned from it. So this is a drawing on the wall of the Good Chance Theatre, just reminding you all the time what's actually happening, that people are leaving this camp to strap themselves to the bottom of a lorry and try to go through the Channel Tunnel and under the most dangerous circumstances. This is the art school of the Calais jungle run by this extraordinary person called Alpha, who was an artist from Mauritania who traveled to the Calais jungle. And I'll tell you more about him in a minute. This is some of the art of the Calais jungle. Again, just reminding you of what it is that we've actually dealing with here. And this many, many restaurants and cafes. This is the famous Afghan cafe, which became the basis of a um, play in London. And some of the food from the Afghan cafe which was some of the best food in Northern France. I think much to the aggravation of the local population. It also had radio stations. Um, it had its own radio station broadcast to the Calais jungle. And housing. I want to focus for a moment on housing because the work that we're doing at the moment in Izmir is around housing prototypes. So all we architects, we like to talk about housing, we like to talk about typologies of housing, and we like to look at the way in which houses evolve over time and their details and the way they're made are um, refined over time. And I think just to carry on saying, you know, the Calais jungle is a city, it has public buildings, it has high streets, it has housing. Let's just track the evolution of the housing in the Calais jungle, from very crude shelters, terrible shelters, to slightly bigger shelters, through to shelters that began to become more and more codified, made into a sort of typology, and often built by unskilled um, volunteers with the help of displaced people themselves. 
ultimately it was a simple typology of, of houses built on either four wooden pallets, the things that you carry goods on, or six. And these are some of them. Like all good architectural types, there's a sort of language of detailing. So here I'm wanting to trace the detail that's emerged in the Calais jungle of how you stop nails pulling out of the plastic cover that you put over one of these simple shelters. This is the batten detail, so a piece of wood. This is the cardboard, the piece of cardboard detail. And this is my favorite, which is the colored bottle top detail. And of course, it all comes together in, in wonderful houses like this. So there is a language of housing, both in terms of its detailing, but also in terms of its typology. These simple shelters, these four pallet, six pallet houses, if you went to the Sudanese area of the Calais jungle, they were laid out in such a way that you really felt you were in a Sudanese village. If you went to the Afghan part of the village of the Calais jungle, they were laid out into courtyards in exactly the same way as they would be laid out in Afghanistan. So here we are, we have all of these things happening within the Calais jungle. And here you see it, here you see the two worlds right next to each other. The formal world of the French authority where you had to enter it and you have to register and in front of you the informal camp um, that I've shown you in, in the last few minutes. Of course the Calais jungle was a city that was ultimately demolished, um, cleared, and I think one of the things that's really interesting to talk about is what happened at the point at which the Calais jungle, the Calais refugee camp, camp was cleared. There was a lot of unrest, a lot of riots associated with the clearing of the Calais jungle. And it's interesting to know what was actually going on at that time when the Calais jungle was cleared. One of the things that's really important is that obviously, um, in being cleared of the jungle, you, 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 and, and taken into registration, you gave up your opportunity to travel to the UK or beyond. So people were fighting, not just for um, the piece of land or the buildings that they built, but they were fighting for the ability to carry on their journey to safe passage to somewhere where there was a degree of, of, of security. And here you see the Calais jungle before it was demolished, above and you can just see actually the formal part of the camp is really small compared to the informal part and here you can see it after it was cleared so here is the formal camp the remains of the informal camp and the area that was cleared um, to the left during the time at which the Calais jungle was under attack for being cleared a lot of authorities or, or volunteers wanted to try to preserve it. And they made the argument under French law that it was a city, that people lived there, that it had civic buildings and should be respected like any other settlement. That went to a court of law in Calais um, and the court acknowledged that it was a city, but what the French authorities then did was to demolish everything except the civic buildings. So the school was left, but no houses. The church was left, but no houses. So our argument was that this was actually a recognition of the fact that this was a city. It was a functioning community in the way in which I've described to you. And that was in a sort of perverse way recognized by the French authorities. Straight after the demolitions, we tried through the Global Free Unit and with collaborators to try to take the argument that I've been making to you, that there is something to learn from this place and to try to raise awareness, awareness of that in London. And we did that in three ways, three exhibitions and events in 2016 in London. The first of which was the Papers Festival, 
in London's Barbican Centre, which is a big art centre right in the centre of the city. And it was a day long festival looking at the art, culture and architecture of the refugee crisis. Just at the moment at which the demolition had taken place, we were trying to celebrate that culture, try to say, take it seriously, don't ignore it, don't believe that it's just simply a place of, of crime and total desperation. There is something to be learned from it. So we brought together lots of the people who'd been evicted from the Calais jungle and we had an event in London. It was called Papers, not just because of the idea of having papers in order to travel, but because of this. When the Calais jungle was demolished, 265 unaccompanied minors, so children, were lost when the Calais jungle was demolished. And this artist working with Afghan um, migrants cut out a figure of a child to represent each of those people, each of those children who were lost, never to be found again when the Calais jungle was evicted. So papers in two senses. We brought together lots of people who had commented on or worked in the Calais jungle. We heard testimony from people like uh, Marwa Al Sabuni um, and others. We had people who'd volunteered um, within the Calais jungle. We had art that had come from the refugee crisis. We showed how some of the shelters had been built. We had art coming directly from Syria, activist art, and we had refugee kids playing football with local kids. We had prizes. We had citizen journalists um, showing work and photographs that had been taken by people themselves within the camp. We had lots of eating. We had young unaccompanied asylum seekers from the south coast of England cooking for visitors. We had pieces of work that represented the journey that you're all very familiar with. And we had quite a lot of sort of crying going on. What was amazing though was the sort of culture. So this was about the culture, the people, the vitality of the refugee crisis. So if there's an architectural vitality, there's also a human vitality. How can one mobilize that? How can one turn that into education? The second piece of work in 2016, if the first one was about people, we're all the same, there's something to be learned by talking to each other. This one was much more hardcore. This was part of the Festival of Love in the Royal Festival Hall, again in central London. Those kids again. But what we're doing here is a simple little pop-up show that was looking at the urbanism of the Calais jungle those things that I've been telling you about. Think of it as a city. Think of it as something you can learn from. And we brought together some people who've been working in that way. The most powerful of which, now remember the Calais jungle has been demolished at this point, is this extraordinary map produced by architectural students and by volunteers, mapping every single building in the demolished city jungle. The act of surveying itself is an act of commitment and validation of a place. It's now, with, with the Calais jungle demolished, it's like a diagram of Pompeii or Herculaneum. It's something that is entirely lost, but is something of value. So here you see the theater, here you see the migrant church, you'll see all of these extraordinary um, public buildings. So there's the plan of the migrant church itself. The act of surveying, of measuring, means that you actually have to go in to every building, every house, every church, every school, and you have to talk to people. So surveying itself is a really, really important technique, which I think we're trying to use in the projects now within 
within Izmir. And here is some further work. We, in the public realm practice I work in called Publica, we often look at high streets. So long linear high streets within British towns or European towns, and we survey them. So we thought it was important to survey the high street of the Calais jungle, looking left, looking right, and then drawing it in the same way that we would draw a high street in London or a high street in a Scottish city, looking at the land use, all the time trying to say, this is important. This is a counterpart to the way in which people normally think about and look at displacement. So the third investigation in 2016, first one about people in the Barbican, second one about urbanism within the festival hall was also part of the festival of love and it centered on a single individual and how our work could help that individual. Do you remember that art school and the art? This is Alpha, this is Alpha um, who spent five years traveling to the Calais jungle from Mauritania, where he um, was forced to leave. He was one of the first people to arrive within the Calais jungle. And he was one of the first people to build a house. So this is Alpha arriving. And what's really powerful, if you're thinking about architecture and identity within the refugee crisis, is the way in which Alpha built his house and how he built it and what it meant. In Mauritania, it's, it's traditionally a migrant culture. And when people arrive or when a family or a, a, a village arrive at a new site, they use the local materials to make their houses. So Alpha did exactly the same. There was nothing there. So he made a roof in the same way that he would in Mauritania, out of local sticks taken from the sand dunes. And he also made a straw roof using the straw that um, was growing by the seaside. And he plaited it, he made it into a roof using this ancient Mauritanian technique of plaiting, of weaving, which is the same way in which Mauritanian women, his mother, his sister, um, his grandmother weave their hair. And this way of weave, weaving the roof has immense cultural and emotional significance to anybody from Mauritania, identity. So this is his house. It's called the Blue House on the Hill. It was on a slight hill in the center of the Calais jungle in the um, Sudanese area. And we think that because of its strong cultural identity, its sort of power as an icon, it became the center of everything to do with art practice within the Calais jungle. It attracted art artists from within the Calais jungle and attracted people visiting the Calais jungle to talk about art with the people who were there. It was really powerful, in a sense, quite sort of threatening as a result of that. This is the day before the demolition. And we felt it was really important, this building, like rescuing a temple from, from uh, Palmyra um, before it was destroyed. We felt this was a really, really important building, an artifact of the Calais jungle. So we decided to rescue it, um, to save it. And we packed it up, we took it apart, and we put it in a lorry and we brought it to the UK with all of its material. This is after the demolition. There it is, the blue house on the hill. On the right is after the demolition. The French authorities, one could argue, felt it was such a sort of powerful icon. They not only demolished the house, or and we took away the house, they also demolished the hill. We decided to restage the Blue House on the Hill in the centre of London, on the South Bank, where five million people passed it each summer. And the intention was to use 
his house as a way of getting the artist Alpha permission to come to London. We never got that permission. We wanted him to come to London, thatch his own house, make his own house, have the right to be in the UK, have the right to settle. He was never allowed to do that. Blue House was in the Barbican, the Blue House was in the South Bank. The Blue House was even accepted into the Victoria and Albert's Museum's permanent collection, but we could still not get one Mauritanian refugee to come to London. So when we staged the house in London, we had to learn how to thatch like a Mauritanian. So with Alpha on the mobile phone telling us how to plait the straw, we learnt to plait, we learnt to be Mauritanian, and ultimately the house was staged in London, waiting for, for Alpha to come and finish it. He never did. First show, we're all the same. Second show, urbanism. Third show, one refugee represented by his house and how difficult it is to help him. And this is what I think Alpha, last time I saw him, he said, my dad went to London, all I got was this lousy t-shirt. So he wasn't very impressed by what happened and our ability to help him. And I think it's just indicative of a you know, much wider problem. All the time when we were working within the, these places, whenever somebody found out I was a teacher of architecture or, or art and design, they'd say, Robert, you know, what's going on here? What's education doing about this? I'm here volunteering. I'm a displaced person. I'm building shelters. I'm sorting out infrastructure. I'm digging sewers. I'm doing all of that. I'm planning a housing layout. They'd point and say, we built that theater. We built that school. We built that um, church. Why can't this be part of education? And I didn't have an answer for them. They kept saying, why do I need to go back into formal education? Why do I need to pay for the infrastructure of, of an educational institution? Can't you find a way of allowing what I'm doing to be um, credited as education? That was the challenge which led to the Global Free Unit. And I'll um, tell you something about that. The Global Free Unit has its origins in 2004 in an educational in initiative called the Free Unit, which allowed students to make their own projects linked to their own ethical and moral way of operating, um, free of the ideology of any single school tutor, studio or, or, or project. And this had various structures, which I think one sees now within the Global Free Unit. You sign a contract and that contract can take many forms. It's a contract between you and your tutors in which you define how you wish to be assessed. What are the rules by which you operate? We also ask students to choose 10 project friends um, who co-run the project. They operate as consultants but they also take part in the assessment of a student's work at the end. So we're shifting the power between student and tutor. We give a part of the project halfway through the year directly to the people we're working with. Situated learning, live projects, live project environments. And another time I'll tell you about these extraordinary gifts that students have given to the people they're working with. This is somebody working in Kosovo with a village destroyed by the war, but how they could regenerate a, a metalworking industry. So ongoing projects, personal projects, live projects, often really quite radical. This is one that was entirely done through writing. So in 2015, when all those people said, how can you set up an educational structure that answers that question? How can we recognize working in tough places as architectural education, design education? By 2015, we realized that actually since 2004, so many marvelous students had worked all over the world um, in different troubled places from 
South Korea and North Korea, all the way through to the favelas of Rio. And the student um, named it the free world in a very sort of coy way, but we realized that within this free world, all these people who'd worked since 2004 all over the world was a resource to try to answer that question. How do you set up an alternative way of engaging with the world that you can call education ultimately? So the Global Free Unit became a series of live project classrooms all over the globe, curated by people or hosted by people who'd been through the educational system of the Free Unit. Bringing you up to date, so by 2020, we had 20 academic, NGO, arts, governmental and commercial partners working in live project classrooms in the United Kingdom, in Greece, in Turkey, in Bosnia, um, South Korea, Russia, and, and most recently, Colombia. So what I'd like to do now to finish is just take you on a tour of these classrooms particularly the ones that deal with displacement, and, and that includes the work we're doing within um, Turkey. Before that, in 2020, last year, we were just asked to take part in the Oslo Architecture Triennale as an example of a devolved um, educational structure. The theme of the Biennale was degrowth this idea that the economy of the world is shrinking um, in, in, in response to scarcity. And we were there as the educational version of that. And we tried to represent the idea of the global free unit in, in form. And we invited this man who collaborates with us in our Russian classroom. He's a local woodworker to try to represent exactly what the global free unit is. And he chose to represent it in the form of, a, of an orrery. An orrery is the sort of 18th century way in which you represent the planets, the solar system. And we saw that as quite a beautiful way of representing what the global free unit is, which is a series of interconnected but separate classrooms that are related to each other in a single structure, just like the planetary system that are constantly in movement and form new alliances and relationships as they touch and meet. And this is what he built. He built this extraordinary sort of mobile, you see it in the center there, over a map of the free world, with each stick representing um, each of the classrooms and the way in which they moved and touched each other over time. So here we are. Um, what the first classroom I'll just tell you about in the next quarter of an hour or so. Um, the first one is in Lesbos, where we've been working since 2015, working with various partners, including the wonderful Office of Displaced Designers. And this is one of the first drawings made within that classroom. This is a drawing done in 2015, early 2016, which is a master plan for the refugee camp called PICPA, which supports vulnerable refugees. And this was a drawing done with refugees over time, where we layered in the form of a conversation, lots and lots of things that had been discussed, and we just literally put them on the piece of paper. It's a sort of time-based layered master plan. This master plan talked about how one um, organizes the camp. It talks about um, suggestions to the volunteers and the people organizing it. It relates to specific buildings. It talks about details. We also did drawings in real time. So sitting um, drawing in real life on the site um, with people coming and looking at the drawings and making suggestions. And this is just one of the this is just one of the structures built. This is the Solidarity Dome, um, which is a place where people can um, meet. It also represents a sort of overflow. It's also a kindergarten and so on. But with so many of these projects within the refugee crisis, things change. So 
PICPA has now just been demolished, rather like the Calais camp, it was demolished in the autumn um, by Greek police um, using tear gas and, and riot shields. So the vulnerable refugees were, were displaced from that. The other camp we've worked in is the infamous Moria camp on Lesbos, designed for 1,500 people as a, as a military camp, which at the height of last year had, I think, over 20,000 people living in and around the camp. And last summer, we were invited by Stand By Me Lesbos, a charity with students to rebuild the school that they ran on Lesbos for 1,500 children and young people within the camp. So we got very far in terms of designing that. This is a memory map built, drawn by one of the students, um, recording the closed part of the camp where you can't take photographs. So this is a memory map, mapping, surveying, just like the drawings in Calais by Calais Builds. Of course, COVID, it remains and was a very high concern within the camps. And this is quite interesting. This is just a map, a drawing by somebody else um, showing the density in a refugee camp and the density of people within a UK supermarket. So we were asked to make schemes with students in, a, in, a, in one of the global free unit classrooms to rebuild that school, burnt down by fascists in early 2019 um, as part of uh, um, Stand By Me Lesbos. So this is looking from the site towards the camp. This is the sort of survey work that students were doing. This is a wonderful scheme that was developed where effectively there was a short term shading structure and then a long term negotiated educational environment under it. Detailed plans, attitudes towards ventilation and heating, details of how it would be constructed, how these polytunnels, which were redundant on the island, would be used to start making the school simple things about how one could make temporary classrooms, all costed, all ready to go in October last year. And then of course the camp itself burnt down. So we're now involved with students in how to provide temporary schools that can support people in their new camp called Moria 2, which is a closed camp. And here we are coming back to where we are now. And again, I hesitate to say too much. So I will be happy to be told we've got it wrong. But since 2015, been very, very interested in the situation in Izmir, in two parts of the city. One is Basmani, um, which as you all know, is the area where during the height of the refugee crisis, um, displaced Syrians met before being, um, before traveling across to Lesbos and also working in the farm camps. In the centre of Izmir, we're working with the Tiafe Community Centre, which supports um, Syrian families, mainly women, a lot of them widowed and children, um, in terms of day-to-day -day needs, but also settlement and housing. And this is part, as Meltem has said, now part of quite a formal Global Challenge Research Fund, um, which Yasha is a part of, called Wellbeing, Housing and Infrastructure in Turkey, together with um, Professor Hanif Kader of AKT2 Engineers and two um, NGOs working in, in Izmir. So just some fragments of this, and I'll encourage you at the end to go and see the exhibition that's on in Tiafe at the moment. But these are drawings done by students, both your students and students from Sweden, looking at that piece of water looking at the urbanism and um, occupation of, of Basmani, working with these types of families. This is a, in fact a Kurdish family who we met in 2016 and have worked with, spending time in the housing situations, drawing, talking, recording. And these are some of the drawings that have been done in the last sort of nine months or so 
looking at some of the areas, trying to understand them, trying to understand where there are opportunities to intervene and trying through extraordinary drawings, I think, to really look for opportunities. And we're right in the middle now of how we would intervene, make new housing infrastructure, both at the scale of an individual unit, but also at the scale of a city block. And by the end of the academic year in May, um, how these actually begin to make whole new urban quarters um, within Basmani, Katafakali, et cetera. working with the Tiafa Community Centre, working with these two marvellous women um, who run and own it. Um, they're supporting the sort of local population as well. And again, that moment where you sort of understand what's really going on through things like children's art. This is a drawing by uh, a child from, from Aleppo. We're working now towards a building project to design structures on the roof. And we've been asking students to help with that. So see, these are some of the student drawings looking at Tiafe within the context of the whole of Vismia. And then short term, medium term, long term proposals as to how due to fundraising, we can begin to um, help Tiafe over time. Going up to the most final stage, which is about building short-term housing on top of Tiafi itself. And some of the drawings students have produced. And of course, part of it is a, that's a real understanding of how you raise money, how you make it happen. You don't just talk about it. You support your partners to, to communicate it, to get consensus, to get support and you look for funding and sponsorship wherever you can. The other side, as you know, will be the work in Torbali, the farm camps um, outside Izmir, where many, many Syrian families, whole extended families, are working as migrant labour on settled on private land, often in appalling conditions. And since 2016, been collaborating with a marvelous group called um, the Tribe Projects um, run by somebody called Kelly Scott, um, who's just trying to be working in, in this environment, dealing with very simple issues like this, you know, how do you deal with the excess gases from the stoves in such a way that um, the kids aren't poisoned by carbon monoxide um, poisoning because it's filled up with water overnight through to trying to find ways of making very cheap shelters that can be better than the ones they have at the moment. Also a number of educational projects, very small scale, looking at sort of local buildings and just trying to find ways of making that building type a little bit better. And again, the students are looking at this in a more formal way. So they're beginning to look at some of the things I've just been showing you. And they're working in a particular site um, close to Torbali where there's an existing concrete structures and they're producing detailed proposals now for new housing, linking the village to the camp and providing new forms of training for, for, uh, and education. Some of the students have also been doing what one might describe as sort of direct participatory work within the farm camps. This is a rather marvellous workshop done, I think, three years ago, where students were making a dream catcher workshop with local kids, which was really moving, uh, articulating and discussing dreams. And to bring you right up to date, um, the show is now open. And Melton, you should say something about this afterwards, but. Um, the students, your students, um, the Swedish students, volunteers have put on an exhibition in the Tiafe Community Centre, which opened last week, um, where all of the proposals, both for Tiafe and for um, Basmani and for Torbali, are on display. And this is the 
feedback ready for the final stage of the projects, but also we are pushing very hard now to fundraise to build on the roof of, of Tiafe uh, next summer. And these are just some of the images from opening of, of the show last week. I want to end in the last few minutes just without saying very much, just show you some of the other um, current classrooms which relate directly to the work in Izmir. This is work in for the Kent Refugee Action Network, which is a group that supports 15 to 18 year old young asylum seekers on the south coast of England, often people who've arrived by boat. And we've been working with students of the Brighton School of Architecture and others within the context of another research project about displacement, placemaking and well-being in the city um, to design a new building for them on this site. Again, participatory, lots of conversations and just some examples of the student proposals, short-term um, garden structures that could be built by the displaced boys themselves through to a comprehensive scheme where the building is built over time and it uses innovative forms of construction such as mud, brick um, construction, um, which train the boys and others, because um, it's mainly boys, in construction techniques. So again, this is um, something which we're hoping to realise over the next few years. We're also carrying out workshops, and there's another one this summer, if anybody wants to join it in, in Colombia, um, linked to a very a partner in the project, Xenia Jube. And this is looking at mapping for the first time displacement from Venezuela to Colombia. So the first act of recognizing the problem in material and spatial terms is to map it. And these are some of the drawings made by students last summer trying to describe the journey at the scale of, of the countries and, and the, the meta journey right the way through down to um, arrival within Barranquilla, which is one of the arrival cities within the Colombian and Venezuelan refugee crisis. Mapping and recording individual experiences and journeys and again, just uh, the intention next summer now is to build. And finally, just um, three others. We're working within this prison in the north of England, again for young offenders, training young male prisoners, 15 to 18 year old, in how to be architects and designers. First, by looking at their own environment and altering it but with the express intention that these boys will become um, part of working with the Global Free Unit in terms of working within the humanitarian sector, which would be wonderful as far as we're concerned. And finally, just looking here at investigations around actually how you do some of this in material terms. This is the final workshop this is long term work we've been doing. We've had a classroom within rural Russia um, since 2015. And working with the extraordinary land artists, Nikolai Poliski, um, who has used art practice to regenerate a rural community, five post Soviet um, collective um, farms and villages. And we've been working there with local construction techniques. Um, to build an, uh, an open air classroom um, that links the art park to the local village. And this is just some of the work that students have been doing, building, making, um, using local labor, using their own energy, doing something useful. And this is a work in progress the indoor classroom in the back black building and beyond it, the outdoor classroom. And finally, we're all showing this together with you from um, university. We're showing all of this work within the Venice Architecture Biennale this summer 
in the Korean National Pavilion, which has the um, title Future School. So hopefully that will be an opportunity to discuss in great depth um, how um, this sort of educational attitude that um, you're involved in um, will be communicated and, and hopefully um, supported by others. Um, we'll be bringing together in that work, um, in the Biennale, we'll be bringing the boys from the prison in Weatherby, we'll be bringing hopefully people from the displaced classrooms, both volunteers and, and displaced people, and we'll have that extraordinary conversation um, in the summer. So we're really looking forward to that. So thank you. I think there's just one thing just to end on, which is really just a reminder of that thing at the very beginning of the talk that I worry about, which is this sense that we owe a duty of care to wider society and we owe a duty of care to everybody who our actions affect. Uh, and I hope in a very small way that some of the work that you've seen and the work that the students are now doing exercise that duty of care in quite a quite a powerful way and I hope that begins to hint at a, a generation of practitioners who are operating with a high degree of conscience, compassion um, and are being really useful in difficult circumstances. So thank you, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Robert, very much for this very inspiring um, lecture in thinking about the notion of breaking uh, boundaries in many different ways, not just um, national boundaries, social, economic, political, but also architectural boundaries and educational boundaries. The way we think about architecture, uh, how we define it, the constructs behind it, and uh, of course, the case of Calais a Jungle and your take on it is extraordinary. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So I would like to um, take questions uh, uh, from the audience, if that's OK with you. Um, we have a question in the chat um, uh, from uh, uh, Professor Baidar, Gusen Baidar. Was there any collective resistance against demolition in the Calais camp? Against, sorry, against what? Demolition. Against the demolition. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of, I mean, there was obviously the rioting that I showed you, which was terrible. And there was a lot of violence, physical violence in, in the form of, of resistance. But I think what, was very, very interesting was the way in, in which legal challenges were made. And the one I described was this sense of, it was a place where people lived and their basic human rights had to be protected. So there was a challenge in the courts against the demolition, which resulted in the demolition that I showed you. There was also um, a wonderful group of volunteers who, um, surveyed the inhabitants of all of the jungle and they demonstrated that there were 1500 unaccompanied young people in the camp um, and surveyed it and produced evidence and that the French authorities were in breach of, of human rights by evicting young children who had nowhere to stay. But the evictions went ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, other questions? You can also turn your microphone on and um, ask the question that way as well. Uh, we have a question from Merve. Um, Calais was a functioning refi refugee camp, but was the main issues that was missing I mean, Cali was not, a, I mean, most of the contexts that I've been sharing with you are outside the normal, they're informal camps. They're looking at camps where the, they've been generated by themselves. They're not official. So the Cali jungle was not official. There was no 
governmental support for the camp. In fact, quite the opposite. There was um, rules against volunteers volunteering. There was rules against building in the camp. So part of our research is to look at situations that lie outside the normal humanitarian response and seeing what it is that one can learn from those situations that might ultimately enrich and support more formal um, refugee camps. Okay, thank you. Um, you can speak, uh, you can raise your hand, anybody, and um, um, ask your question that way. Uh, but unfortunately, we do not have permission to access microphones. Somebody is writing. So can we take care of that? <laughs> Dear all, uh, you can raise your hand from the bottom down of your screen. And if you raise your hand, I will allow you to, we will open the sound, you will be allowed to open your microphone. So just raise your hand if you have a question or you can write it in the chat as you prefer. Thanks. Okay, there is another uh, question in the chat. I don't know, Robert, can you see the chat? Yeah, I can see the chat now. That's incredibly useful. Okay, um, let me just uh, refer to it, yeah. Now that's a really, really interesting, really interesting question about what happens and what students experience from it. Again, I'm nervous to say anything because I imagine that some of the students in the audience are actually experiencing this, but I suppose in my humble way, what I think happens is that there can be a tendency for formal design or architectural education to take you further and further away from your own motives, your own life experience, your own sense of ethical and moral and even political belief. We tend to inherit through education a set of codified beliefs, which are the beliefs of the profession, the belief of the school, dare I say, the belief of one's tutor. What one finds is that when students work directly, one-to-one, -one, personally in such situations, they reconnect what they're doing to what they believe in, and they become quite powerful and quite certain about what it is they want to do in practice, and happier more purposeful, um, and I'm really proud of that when it happens. And so many students who've been through some of this history ultimately make practices, which might not be dealing with displacement, but they deal with issues they really believe in. And they tend to give up values of competition, of star architecture, of um, elitism, and, and become really effective practitioners. Some don't, but some do. I think there are two other questions in the chat. Um. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the lost children or um, effectively when the camps were, when the Calais jungle was disbanded, um, you had two choices as a refugee, one of which was to be taken into the French system and to be registered and a lot of, you know, some displaced people did that, a lot did that. But if you wish to carry on your journey, basically the people who were evicted from the Calais jungle just disappeared into the local countryside. And within that, a lot of the children and young people, and by children one means people up to, I think, the age of, of 18, um, just disappeared back into the sort of non-centralized, illegal um, situation. I mean, many probably ultimately crossed the channel. Um, so they're lost in the sense that they're no longer traceable. But there is a real concern that some of the more vulnerable children were um, exploited or lost in a true sense. 
Melis, can we ask you to um, ask your question in person? Maybe you can turn your camera on and that may be a, you know, more personal way of, um, uh, is it possible? So maybe not. Um. Oh. There it is. Can you hear me now? Yes. I, hear you, but I can't see you. So. Oh, okay. Uh, camera, cameras are not uh, oh. open for, atten for attendees. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm feeling well, quite displaced. Uh, I was wondering before the demolition, was there a formal uh, complaint about the camp, or was this movement, this demolishing process, was only planned by the government? Yeah, no, I mean, I have to emphasize again what I said, which is I am in no way trying to say that the camp, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to say that camp was a good place to be. Um, there was violence, there was exploitation, there was um, gender issues, poor sanitation. That's not, that is not the point I'm making. It was absolutely right that um, it should be um, addressed. The research and the polemic is about the fact that if you go to the opposite extreme and you produce problem solutions that are only about utility, about problem solving, you produce equal and opposite problems because you're ignoring identity, you're ignoring um, history. In Northern Sweden, which where the government is extraordinary in terms of the infrastructure it provides to displaced people. They have fantastic access to housing, fantastic access to schooling, um, to everything, to healthcare. Um, everything in terms of utility and safety is taken care of. There are very high levels of, of mental illness and self-harm and suicide because actually the Swedish authorities are not so good at dealing with integration and celebrating the culture that displaced people carry with them. So the thesis is really that there is a, there is a balance between problem solving and dealing with sort of underlying cultural material and emotional issues, and you've got to get it right. So our polemic in the early, in 2016, was quite a sort of anarchic way of just saying, look, Look carefully at these places, don't dismiss them. There's something here to be learned against the backdrop of terrible deprivation and violence and discomfort. So I am not advocating that refugees should be housed in the Calais jungle. But the work that we're doing, Meltem, in, in, uh, in our research project will solve that problem, I'm confident of it. We've got a couple of weeks left. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a question by Cheyenne. Cheyenne, do you want to ask your question? You can turn the microphone on. I believe Cheyenne is in Pakistan, so. Yeah. I can see the the question. Okay. No, it was a, it was a pure it was a pure free for all. It was a pure. Um, terrible sort of capitalist model of, of, of commerce and so on. But within that, um, again, were some of these clues as to how one would make a better job of a, of a traditional camp. And exactly the same terrible factors are operating on a lot of, say, Tiafis, um, what we call clients, in terms of the way in which they're exploited by private landlords and so on. So always there are these really difficult economic, social, legislative issues. And then there is actually um, the need to deal with that and, and find ways of dealing with infrastructure as well as architecture. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if I'm not seeing any uh, questions here, Matthew. Oh. We have a question by Demand. Do you want to ask your question by turning on your microphone? Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Uh, it's uh, it's Hugh, actually. I I I, I wasn't sure uh, whether you were referring to me. Anyway, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting account of your work. My question is, it's a kind of a general question, really. It's should schools of architecture put more emphasis on ethical practices and design? And if so, how? You know, I mean, within their curricula, curriculum. Yeah. Well, crikey, it's, it's a huge question, Hugh. Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and of course, a lot of work is being done in architecture schools to embed um, climate change, to embed issues of diversity and gender within education by decolonizing the curriculum, um, doing all sorts of, of activities and, and hard work in relation to that. I suppose um, the work that we're doing in the Global Free Unit and the Free Unit before it was a sort of um, a more sort of brutal sense of understanding that if you place students in an environment where they're confronted with some of the global challenges, um, it speeds the process up uh, and begins to bring about change, not only in the way in which they operate, but change within the institutions they're a part of more quickly. And I think we have seen that. We have a question by Oya Digar. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I wanted to know to what extent in the formal camps, uh, to what extent are the refugees allowed to personalize their space? Because they're not, they're temporarily there. So I assume it's not a lot. And I just want to know how the process yeah, works. Yeah. Really. Um, I think it depends. I think it depends which regime it's operating under. And I think there are very good ones in certain countries, but generally very little opportunity to personalize those situations, not least because they are temporary, even if they last for much longer than one imagines. But also often there's very sort of partial ownership or, or security in terms of the particular places that people are operating in. There's also this sense that if you settle in too much, if you your chances of being able to move on are, are diminished. So there's this big conversation about whether something should appear temporary or is temporary um, against things being permanent and in being permanent imply that you cannot um, travel on. I mean, the biggest, the, the really sort of strong example, I think of the sort of mismatch between architectural culture generally and some of the issues around the refugee crisis and displacement is the famous IKEA shelter, which you'll all know, the flat pack shelter made by IKEA, which won huge awards in terms of design. It was design of the year. It's in the design museums. It's, it's considered to be an exemplary piece of design. Um, but it was then subsequently discovered that it was quite dangerous in terms of fire risk because of its um, construction. In the summer, it was unbearably hot and in the winter, unbearably cold. There was virtually no way of customizing it. But for me, the thing that was most distressing and um, I suppose exemplifies this tension between being practical or apparently practical and emotional factors was I heard on Lesbos that one of the reasons that children didn't like to sleep in it was that when the wind blew, it makes a noise, a sort of creaking noise, flapping noise, that sounds a little bit like the noise that you would have if you're in a boat at sea and children were terrified. So this thing that we've all celebrated as being a wonderful design object has real problems. And we didn't pick any of that up when we gave it prizes. And there's 10,000 of them, I think, or 100,000 of them sitting in warehouses now, unused. So we got it really wrong there and we got our values wrong in celebrating it. Um, go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, 
Danke, Hans. Uh, let's, um, I think uh, there is another question, uh, Robert, in the chat by Leman. Um, would you like to respond to that one? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The question about integration and um, clearly, I mean, in the work that we're all now doing, um, the conversations we're having around Basmani, it's a hugely important issue. Just as there's a balance between celebrating identity and providing utility in a generic way, the calibration of how much um, identity you preserve whilst also trying to bring about integration is incredibly complex. And I think were you to be able to see the exhibition in Tiafe, so many of the students are really struggling and dealing with this in really interesting ways. So looking for sort of common processes, common forms of construction, um, ways of, of making space, a sort of spatial DNA of the housing that they're designing, which is looking for the crossovers between, in this case, say a Syrian culture and Turkish culture, um, but also just looking for maybe a third way that is neither that takes benefit from both. So integration is absolutely critical, particularly given the fact that you know, that figure of 17 years is, is rising now. Thank you, Robert. I think um, we don't have any other questions, but there are some comments in the chats. Uh, a comment from uh, fourth year instructors, Zlam, uh, and uh, she uh, thanks you about this presentation. You can read that. And the one from uh, Matthew, <laughs> he's French, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Matthew, but. Um... No, I was really happy to hear it. So it's just <laughs> what I wanted to, to tell because what you are describing is what I heard about the action of government, go, the government, but what was happening inside was a hidden part of the story that even if you're really interested into the subject and you don't know, and as I was living in Turkey, I was not able to go deep inside or didn't have the time for it. So I was so happy to see what was really happening and how people were really dealing with it. So thanks a lot again for, for it. Good. Okay, who is asking uh, about the exhibition? Oh. Uh, could you please write the location of the exhibition? It's the Tiafi uh, Community Center in uh, Basmane area. And we will send you the poster. Uh, maybe uh, we can do that in the chat. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your interest. Um, let me just... Um, uh, finish maybe by uh, mentioning, it's been also a great um, learning experience for me to be a part of these live classrooms and uh, thinking about um, um, the um, uh, architectural education and the refugee crisis in different ways. So it's, it's really inspiring. And I think it's so fitting to our, um, the theme of breaking boundaries in this design fest. I would like to thank you again, Robert, for taking your time and uh, uh, giving us this presentation today. As a token of our appreciation, we have this uh, certificate on the screen for you. It's a sapling. Um, it, a sapling has been planted in your name uh, in the Yashar University Commemorative uh, Forest. So we will also send this to you through email. <laughs> as thank a of our appreciation, but thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone um, uh, for um, joining us uh, for this very inspiring uh, presentation uh, lecture. And Robert, is there anything else you would like to add? No, I just say uh, I look forward to meeting some of you when we, we open our first housing for displaced people in Basmani. Yes. That will come out of the work that students are doing this year. So 
Um, I do hope that that's a reality at some point. Yeah, I just wrote down the name of the uh, name of Tiafi for you. Um, yeah, thank you then everybody. Um, have a nice uh, the rest of the day, I guess. Thank you. And I'll see you, Robert. Bye. Bye-bye.